One of the sources I was talking to asked, how do you tell the story of John McAfee? There are frankly many stories, many lives as it were. There was the Silicon Valley tycoon, the party animal, the spiritual guru, the international fugitive, the prophet of cybersecurity and Bitcoin, the alleged murderer and rapist, and in his last act, the death that launched countless new conspiracies. When McAfee tells his own life story, he always starts it the same way. He talks about his father, a violent alcoholic. Here he is on ABC in 2017. One of the things that was not idyllic there was your father. You said that he was a raging alcoholic, that he was abusive to you and to your mother. Well, nobody has an ideal life, even, even children. Dad, when you were 15? 15. Yeah, he shot himself. He shot himself? Yeah. People always look to the past to explain the present. It doesn't work that way. McAfee's father was an American soldier based in southwest England. His mother, Joan Williams, was a Brit. She gave birth to John a little over two weeks after the official end of World War II. The family moved to the US not long after. Here's Fran, John's first wife. She asked us not to use her last name. Unfortunately, his father was a drinker and he turned, he was a mean drunk, as they say. But John and his mom really had the brunt of the, you know, those ghosts in that guy's head that was a living hell. Fran says these early years of abuse haunted John and they kept company with him throughout his life. But absolutely, he was abused emotionally. John had a tremendous volatile temper, which is, it comes from what happened to him during those years up until he's 15. McAfee spent most of his formative years in the town of Salem, Virginia. People close to the family told me he was sent to live with his aunt in England after his father died. He returned to the US in time to attend Roanoke College once he finished high school. He told ABC News that while he studied there, he also sold cocaine. Math came easy to me. I never studied, but I just did what I felt like I should do. In college, McAfee says he began peddling a product he knew he could sell, cocaine. But it's interesting that, that drug dealing was really your first foray into entrepreneurship. Yeah, well, it, it is entre it's entrepreneurship. It's, it's everything. It's salesmanship. This is such a telling interview to me on a couple of levels. First of all, this attitude of superiority, almost narcissism. I don't need to study. It comes easily to me. Then there's the casual admission to drug dealing. Drugs will be a major factor in McAfee's life, cocaine in particular. And of course, his ability to spin an idea into a business was something he replicated repeatedly. After graduating from college, McAfee moved to Monroe, Louisiana, where he taught math as part of a graduate program he was doing at Northeast Louisiana State University. He met his first wife, Fran, when she was an 18-year-old student in his class. And he said that that very first day, right after that very first class, they got together. Fran remembers it slightly differently. I met him when I was 18, probably. He was teaching math. And I walked into my classroom. And he, from the get-go, he made it so obvious. I mean, it was like he latched on. He was, I won't say it was like a vulture by any means, but he picked me out of the group to the point that it was really embarrassing for me because we had this whole classroom there. He made no bones about it that he was attracted to me. In fact, I went home that evening and I said, Mama, I've got to get out of this classroom because I, I'm not going to be able to learn math. And of course, she said, oh, Fran, you'll be just fine. But I knew. His behavior sounded pretty aggressive, practically predatory. But he eventually wore her down and they started dating. Once their relationship became known, McAfee was fired by the university and he soon moved back to Virginia. That was after the university decided that uh, John didn't need to be teaching. <laughs> at 
school, but they allowed him to finish out his curriculum that semester because he was working toward his doctorate through their program. With his academic qualifications in hand, McAfee went on to work at a couple of high-profile companies, Xerox, Univac, Siemens, Booz Allen and Lockheed Martin. The one he seemed to have been most proud of was his time at NASA. He went to work at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, which is on the campus of Columbia University in New York City. He was there from 1968 for about two years. In 2016, McAfee described his work at NASA in an op-ed for Business Insider. McAfee claimed that he encrypted the images sent by the Tyrus weather satellite when he worked at NASA in 1968. I asked NASA several times about McAfee's time there. They said yes, he briefly worked as a programmer, but several current and former NASA employees I spoke to could not confirm his assertions about what he did there. And he made other claims that he'd worked on the Apollo programs and that he came up with the solution to 10 years of data coming in from space without any system to process it. Former NASA engineer Jim Cameron told me this was simply not plausible. He worked at the same Goddard Institute of Space Studies years after McAfee left. He said McAfee's account was an insult to the people whose names are recorded in the volumes of NASA's history. As you'll hear, this is a bit of a pattern with John McAfee. He had a tendency to tell tall tales, to exaggerate, and even straight up fabricate. That stint at Xerox, he told one biographer he was based in London for the company and was flown first class every weekend for six months back to New York to see his family. Not true, people close to the family said. Those were just some of the many lies and exaggerations we've come across. He would later brag about all the journalists he'd played with the tales he'd spun. Eventually, McAfee made his way to Palo Alto. He landed at a company called Omex in the early 80s. They were one of the first companies to build storage devices for data on glass disks that held several gigabytes. I spoke to Rebecca Costa, a colleague of his at Omex. She says her first meeting with John was memorable. And I remember looking out of my office window and seeing this guy drive up in a motorcycle with a black Michael Jackson-looking leather jacket and show up at like 11 o'clock in the afternoon. (laughs) You know, in those days, we worked eight to five. There weren't flex hours. And he didn't even have a, uh, a knapsack or a backpack or anything. He just walked in and I thought, Somebody should call security. Who is that? (laughs) So McAfee comes walking up the stairs. And he came around the corner and I remember him saying, oh, you must be Rebecca Costa. I'm John McAfee. I'm the, I head up a research and development. And I was a little taken back and I said, well, great. Um, We were supposed to have a meeting at eight this morning. And he said, yeah, but I was hung over. In 1981, Rebecca was one of a handful of women with senior executive roles in Silicon Valley. She headed product development. John headed research. His job was to design the software for the operating systems. So I said, would you mind if I came over to the lab and uh, spent some time with you there to try to understand the technology better? And, And he was very forthcoming. And it took me all of 15 minutes in the R&D lab to realize he was brilliant. And I didn't, I didn't care about the rest of it. I didn't care if he set up a bar in R&D and drank all day long. If, if he could solve the kinds of technical problems he was solving, then he was my guy. By this point, John McAfee's character was set. He lived and worked according to his own rules, and he found himself in an environment where that was okay. He was going to show up when he was going to show up. I couldn't necessarily trust him to meet deadlines or stay within budget. But I did what all companies should do with brilliance. Surround them with people that aren't as brilliant. You know, I was one of the people that was surrounding John to make John effective so that we could harness him. Those days at Omex were heady, just as they were throughout the rest of Silicon Valley. There was a sense of pioneership, that new ground was being broken in an industry that was still coming up with names for itself. People were creating things that had never existed before. 
There were no rules here. There were no checks on people's behavior. Everybody was snorting coke. Everybody was sleeping under their desks. And by the way, omics wasn't that unusual in Silicon Valley. You know, you would drive by these startups and the entire parking lot would still be full. We didn't go home. There were days where I had to go in and literally tell John to go home and take a shower. He smelled bad. Those were days of wild successes and spectacular failures. The mouse was invented around this time. Apple, Atari, and Hewlett Packard were all making their products right in the valley. The people at Omex were creating new technology alongside those other companies. But the products they were pushing out weren't selling. Rebecca says the writing was on the wall for Omex, and both she and John McAfee left the freewheeling company after a couple of years there. And when John decided to create his own startup, McAfee and Associates, that mixture of work and play, the recklessness and the chaos, would be part of the company's very foundation. That's next. Let's talk about technology in the 80s and early 90s. Back then, technology seemed so alien to people. In movies, computers were consistently portrayed as evil, like in the Matthew Broderick film, War Games. We're in. Hello. Shall we play a game? Hollywood played on people's distrust of the unfamiliar. Folks who did have computers were more often programmers, people who worked with them for a living, or yes, gamers. Here is Paul Ferguson, who's been in cybersecurity for over 30 years. So there's a lot of hackers who wanted to know how things work. And when you take things apart and you put them back together and you know how they work, you become an expert, but you also find vulnerabilities. And then you can build a whole industry out of it. Paul says that it was a moment where possibilities felt endless. The basic building blocks of today's computer technology were being formed with little thought for the consequences. Collectively, as an industry, we didn't really think about how some of the stuff that we designed and built and put into place to enable all this wonderful connectivity could be used to steal thousands of dollars out of your bank account or take down the, all the new sites in Estonia. In those exhilarating days of the early internet, McAfee was living in Santa Clara. He was in his early 40s working at Lockheed Martin, and he was already on to a new wife, a woman named Judy. Here's Jim Lynch, who lived next door to the couple for about 10 years. They were the kind of neighbours who would wave to each other over the fence and chat about their jobs. He had a phone line brought into his house, a separate one from his regular phone line. And he put a computer there and hooked it up, and it was what they called then uh, bulletin boards. So it's basically a chat room. Bulletin boards were like an early version of web forums or social media. People could connect their computers through phone lines and trade ideas. Jim says that McAfee was a programmer. He was a gamer. He was obsessed with puzzles. He'd upload computer programs onto those bulletin boards and delve into discussions with people who had logged on from around the world. McAfee could sense an opportunity surrounding the internet. He became particularly fascinated with computer viruses. Jim says the first virus that caught McAfee's attention was one called the Pakistani brain. We had coffee together in the front yard one sunny Sunday morning, and he said something about, I've got an interesting new problem to solve, and there's this virus called the Pakistani brain. He explained something to me about it, what it did, and, uh, and that he was fascinated with this. And then it was a few weeks later that he said, this might be the business opportunity of a lifetime for me, and I might not be at Lockheed any longer. The Pakistani brain virus was a self-replicating virus that automatically copied onto disks. It spread like wildfire. Jim says it puzzled McAfee. He took it apart, studied it, and figured out how it worked. And with the help of a programmer named Dennis Yell, who soon went to work for him, McAfee created his first antivirus software program. He describes it on ABC. 
I was figuring out, oh yeah, I can stop this year, I can stop this year, I can stop this year, I can do this, I can actually remove the thing and wrote a program in a day and a half. So McAfee antivirus was created in a day and a half? Yes. And how well did it work? Four million people were using it within a month. Four million people within a month. And McAfee went even further to drum up publicity. Here's Gene Spafford, a computer scientist at Purdue University who was active in the antivirus community. And apparently, I've seen pictures, he had gotten a truck that he had dressed up as an antivirus response unit with lights and big signs on it, uh, sort of like a, a, an amplified version of Ghostbusters uh, uh, doing with the ambulance. And when companies would report a, a virus, he'd drive this to their site to eliminate the virus. The business kind of took off from there, I guess. This was late 1987, early 88. McAfee's business was really taking off. His house now had several phone lines leading into it. More people came into work. One person made the top of the washing machine her workspace so she could answer calls. Another was working from the kitchen table. And Paul says the product was legitimately good. So it was the gold standard. I mean, and pretty much if there was a detection on McAfee's, you pretty much could feel confident in the fact that it was not false positive, right? So it was, there was a general consensus that there, it wasn't just a piece of crap software scanner that it might tell you if you were infected or not. There was actually quality in it. It had a, a good, decent reputation. The business model was simple, and McAfee was pretty clever about it. He didn't put a price on the software he was sending out there. It was called Shareware. Anyone could download the software on their personal computer for free. But when a business wanted the software, they needed a license to use it. And that's where the money was coming from. McAfee became the go-to guy in the media to talk about viruses. They were slowly making their way into the public's mindset as the internet became more and more of a thing. Here he is on PBS NewsHour in 1988. I see infections of small companies where every computer has become infected and the company is near collapse from financial loss. Virus expert John McAfee, president of a newly formed Computer Virus Association, helps companies recover from attacks. The problem is getting worse. We're, we're seeing a new virus arrive on the scene at the rate of about one a month now. Most of the new viruses are worse than the old viruses because they are more subtle more sophisticated, and they cause a great deal more damage. This is a simulation of an attack by a virus that infected 400 computers in Mexico earlier this year. Its effects are obvious, but most viruses work surreptitiously, erasing data files and programs before they're detected. McAfee and others have developed new countermeasures called vaccines and antiviral programs that detect and neutralize viral infections. A few years later, the scariest virus yet came on the scene. It was called the Michelangelo virus. And what made it different was that it was said to infect a device but remain dormant until March 6th, the birthday of the famous Italian sculptor and painter. The virus would then overwrite the data on that disk, destroy the disk, and make it impossible to get that data back. The alarm this caused sent purchases of antivirus software skyrocketing. Here's McAfee talking to Jim Lehrer on PBS NewsHour. Uh, First to you, Mr. McAfee, what is the the potential for havoc from this thing? Well, we know that on the 6th of March, if you are infected with this virus, it will destroy all of the data in your hard disk. The question is, how many systems are infected? Estimates range anywhere from 50,000 to 5 million. Uh, Depending upon the number, and depending upon the number that are still infected by tomorrow, uh, the havoc could be substantial. But you don't have, there's no way to know how many have been infected? Well, it depends on who you believe and and who you listen to. But even the smallest estimates, let's assume that only one in 1,000 computers were infected. That's 60,000 computers worldwide. And at an estimate of $500 to $1,000 for each one to recover, we're still talking $60 million at the very low end in terms of global cost. But in this case, Lara brought on a second computer expert, a guy named Charles Rutstein, from the National Computer Security Association, and he had a different perspective on the Michelangelo virus. 
Dr. Redstein, uh, anything you want to add or subtract to that as far as the impact of this? Yes, I think uh, our estimates are actually significantly lower than that. Uh, current estimates for uh, virus infections by Michelangelo in the U.S. Uh, are currently, from our group, around 10 to 20,000. Uh, and we also say that uh, it probably won't be as expensive as, as uh, Mr. McAfee says. Under certain circumstances, uh, when they are infected, it may not cost a million dollars to clean up. Uh, so we think uh, there will be fewer infections costing less. We called Charles up for this podcast. Apparently, he was only a college student when he was invited to appear on PBS NewsHour. And unlike McAfee, he wasn't selling antivirus software. I was told I was, I was being brought on uh, simply to provide an objective view uh, of, of someone who didn't have any financial interest. Um, you know, it's, it's been said many times in many uh, parts of life that if you want to find the truth, follow the money. And, you know, we had no vested interest. Uh, There was no money trail uh, for us in, you know, inflating or deflating, you know, expectations. But for someone who was running an antivirus company at the time, as John was, uh, there was certainly a financial interest in, in making this perhaps a bigger deal than it was. In the end, the virus impacted a number of devices closer to Charles's more conservative prediction, a few thousand. But the antivirus software industry exploded, and McAfee Software dominated the desktop computer market. My recollection was that it was truly ubiquitous. It was fair to say that they had the leading market share at that time. Um, And it it became, you know, more of a household name than most of the other uh, antivirus uh, suites at the time. They had deals, yep, that pre-installed it on many computers. By this point, venture capitalists began calling the office, looking to invest, and proposing to take the company public. Jim Lynch remembers taking at least one of those calls. And so I went into John. I said, can you take a call? Somebody's asking about the business. And so I handed him that call, and that led to him talking to the VCs, them investing in the company with a plan to take the company public. Jim Lynch says they didn't need to go public. The company was making so much money, But McAfee saw this as his opportunity to achieve another level of success in his career. The investors brought in new management to prepare McAfee and Associates for its IPO. One of the new employees, Andrea Nation, said she found herself covering for John when his wife Judy would come to her with questions. Judy was kind of like a thorn in my side, Uh, always asking questions questioning credit card bills, you know, company American Express bills and everything. And uh, I don't throw anybody under the bus. I don't, you know, like when it comes to stuff like that. We've reached out to Judy for comment, but she has not responded to us as of this recording. The stuff like that Andrea mentions had to do with a series of competitions that took place within the office. They kept a running tally of who had sex with which colleague and where and there was a name for the group of people involved. With the, yeah. So they had the, the Little Foxes group, and, uh, you know, you would get points around the office for having sex and all this other stuff. And, you know, I would I would clean Bill's desk off, and the first time he saw me doing it, he's like, you don't have to do that. What are you, like, yeah, you know, that's above and beyond. I'm like, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> I'm like, this is the most points in the office. And I told him, and he's like, why do we have to get rid of these, get rid of these crazy people? Bill is Bill Larson, the man tasked by investors to take over the company's leadership. Andrea is saying that she was wiping down his desk because other employees had had sex on it the night before. Because in their workplace games, sex on the new boss's desk scored the most points. Andrea says McAfee's office was truly bizarre. There was three employees and they would tell us that they were witches and they would sit in the conference table and they do their Wiccan ceremonies. We had other people that used to come to work in like Renaissance clothing. Um, uh, one Halloween, a guy like actually just wore a cod piece, I, you know, but they were so used to just being able to do whatever they wanted to do. And when when the suit and tie guy came in with Bill, you know, that was really hard for these people, you know. Bill Larson was the chief suit and tie guy. He was brought in by venture capitalists to make McAfee and Associates run more like a company that could go public and meet SEC requirements. So Bill became the new CEO, 
McAfee was named chief technical officer of his own company, and the two never saw eye to eye. John was an amazing technical genius, but he wasn't a leader. He couldn't take the company to the next level, and what Bill Larson did was amazing. Bill Larson was ready for McAfee to leave, and McAfee was ready to cash out, she says. I think it was John's mindset, you know, number one, like, you know, fuck this. You know, these guys are taking this away. But, you know, I think he knew in the back of his mind that he shouldn't be there. Bill always told me from day one, he's like, we're going to get a big building and everybody's going to see the name of the company, but it's not going to be McAfee, you know. Bill Larson eventually got rid of the entire original crew of McAfee and Associates. McAfee stepped down as an employee in 1993 and as a board member in 1995. From our internal calculations, his cash disbursements and stock sales earned him about $84 million. I spoke to a number of cybersecurity experts who said that McAfee antivirus software shaped computer security for decades onward because McAfee introduced his product at just the right time, right when many of today's technologies were being developed. He sparked an entire industry built around convincing people to buy new things that would keep their systems secure. That was his genius. Here's Alan Liska, who's an authority in cybersecurity. He's worked in the industry for nearly 30 years, both as an ethical hacker and a threat intelligence analyst. All of this, and it kind of all started with John McAfee, where he convinced people, oh, no, you shouldn't make a more secure operating system. Instead, you should just buy my software and put that on the operating systems. Alan Liska says that as more and more people went online, they were told antivirus software was a must. And when that wasn't enough, they were told they had to buy more security features, firewalls and proxies and gateways and mail security programs. McAfee set us on a road where instead of building safer operating systems, we buy add-ons. And that hard sell continues today. So rather than pushing people to improve Microsoft security, go buy my thing instead. And then, you know, my company makes lots of money. So that's kind of the genius of John McAfee, not the programming, but his ability to sell this thing that really people shouldn't need. What people should be doing is saying, please make more secure software. So what he's saying is there was a moment when software developers could have resolved to create more secure networks, but instead they relied on antivirus software for protection. So it begs the question, did McAfee actually create a less secure world? In some ways, this was the beginning of the cybersecurity industry, a world we know today that is dominated by firms that are called in when companies like Colonial Pipeline get hacked and the gas stops pumping. These are the people hired to fight viruses and hackers, to deal with attacks that encrypt data and demand ransoms. And John McAfee was kind of like the midwife. And he made bank out of it. Here's Charles Rutstein. It was an extraordinary amount of money in any era. Today means you never have to work again and you can do whatever you want with the rest of your life. And back then it was worth some multiple of that. So in short strokes, you know, the guy had it made. He had it made. But in just over a decade, McAfee will say that he squandered almost all his money. In less than three decades, he would be hanging in a jail cell. How did he wind up losing it all? That's next time on Foundering, the John McAfee story.